So hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Lisa Love. Um, the forum got some feedback that y'all really like to have something a little more um, uh, dynamic to look at during these. So now you got my face. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. You can either thank me or um, tell me how awful it was afterwards. <laughs> whatever happens. Um, I'm a coordinating producer on a PBS Kids show called Sci Girls. Um, you can look it up online at pbskids.org slash Sci Girls and um, it's a gender equitable show to encourage middle school girls to enjoy um, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, but what I'd really like to first start with here is um, this word. It's kind of big, right? It's up on your screen. I hopefully you're not feeling uncomfortable that this word is just sitting large on your screen wherever you are. Um, but it's a word that I like to talk about because you can use um, a, a lot of euphemisms for the word. Um, uh, generally, I like to use people of size or a person of size. Um, however, I do like this word. And the reason why I like it is because we need to take the power back from what it uh, is traditionally used for, which is to shame and hurt others. Um, it's tall, short, thin, and fat, not tall, short, thin, and ugly, or hideous, or whatever you know, synonym you want to use. So I have a couple of polls that I'd like to start out with this word. And the first one is um, it's, you can do in the chat. And I'd just like to know what, what comes to your mind, what words come to your mind when you see this word. And then there's a yes, no poll where I'd like to know, have you ever called yourself fat, whether or not it's true? And I just wanted to give it a second or so to see, you know, sort of how that comes about. What, what you guys, what your thoughts are about this word and about um, yourself in relation to this word. And so. Oh, we got quite a few responses. Wonderful. We've got, uh, uh, we've got Lindy West. I don't know what that means. Um, obese, unhealthy, curvy, thick, lazy, lazy. Feeling hungry, sham, misconception, oh. um, overweight, uh, first reaction uh, to fat equal unhealthy. I think of food, obese, forky, undesirable, heavy. It sort of scares me to see it written down. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, something I should. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, funny, also an interesting one unhealthy, shaming, unhealthy, echo, et lazy, mean, large, obese. Yes, I feel that way daily. Oh, that's for the next one. Um, big boned, uh, a larger than normal person, shame, I am fat. Um, big, lazy, unhealthy. I immediately think of someone who is so big they can't walk, unhealthy, curvy, chubby, hungry, unhealthy. Sadly, I think of a person okay. or, or fat. Yeah, they're quite- I think we're getting the unhealthy going on here. Yeah, like obviously people have um, a lot of feelings and um, responses to seeing that word, but they are, they're quite- It's a, a very people. charged word, yes. And by the way, um, Lisa, this, this chat, well, the chat is saved as well, so you can go back and take a look at it and then look at these answers later. So there's quite a few Wonderful. coming up. But that's, thank you so much for participating in that and being honest and sharing, you know, what comes to your mind. I do appreciate that. And, and clearly there is um, a significant amount of unhealthy. There's a significant, the, the one that stood out to me was um, mean. Um, that's funny. Actually, uh, I think that one, one <laughs> that I just think would be interesting. One says I'm fat and active. But that's the, sure. well, the first positive one. <laughs> Oh, well, yay, <laughs> there's something positive. Um, because there rarely is for people of size um, in relation to the way people think about people of size or fat people. Um, did, did the yes, no poll go up to Ben about, um, have you ever called yourself fat, whether you think you are or not? No, nope, I can post that now. You want me to post that now? Yes, please. I'm okay. curious how many people identify with thinking of themselves as fat. Okay.
Okay. So it's so interesting to me because I'm seeing now that we're about 90% yes, I've called myself that, and 10% no. And I think it's really interesting that most of the words that we use to in the in the previous poll in the chat were kind of negative connotation and now we see that people are in fact calling themselves something that has nothing but negative con connotations to them so it's it's a really harmful um it's a it's a really harmful way that we have framed this word fat which is why i like to take it back and call it uh, what i think it is which is simply a descriptor I'm not thin, I'm fat. I'm not tall, I'm short. You know, uh, it, I have red hair, but that's because I dye it. Um, not because it was that way, but it is still red. You know, I wouldn't say it's, you know, fake red. Well, I guess I could, but um, I guess I just did. But, um, so this word is just really, really charged. And I, I just sort of wanted to make everyone um, just, well, a little bit uncomfortable, I think, before we started, so that you would have a little bit of an idea of what it feels like to be um, a very fat person in our society. So we can take that poll down, or, or do I do that? Yep, if you, I already took it down, you just click on the... I just click on it, okay, okay. super. So, um, let's, uh, I, I'm not gonna do an agenda and everything, because I'm, I'm just not big on those, but let's just say that I am, um, and. I, uh, yeah, I don't like agendas. I feel like we're gonna talk about um, some socio, um, social ex aspects of being fat, but mostly we're gonna try and focus on um, how and toward the end that this all fits into employment um, situations because this is um, an employment forum. Um, I could certainly talk forever about healthcare or the media or any number of other facets, but um, today we're gonna focus on that. But in order to understand that, I think you need to understand uh, if, you, if you are not a person of size, what it is like to be a person of size. And I'm going to, instead of telling you about me uh, with things that you could easily look up on LinkedIn, I'm gonna tell you about me in a different way, quickly. Um, so I was thinner than Michelle. What the heck does that mean? That's really strange, right? What that means is that in kindergarten, I was a little blonde haired chubby girl. And there was another little girl in my kindergarten class who was also a blonde haired chubby girl. But I was thinner than her and I knew it. And I was very conscious of it from the time I was in kindergarten that uh, if I stayed thinner than Michelle, then I wouldn't be the fattest person. And that that was a good thing. And whenever adults would mix us up and call me Michelle, I was just horrified because I could not possibly be confused with Michelle, who I was thinner than. So this is how early it started for me. Um, and that has a lot to do with my family and, you know, my first diets were when I was very little. And, um, you know, I come from a long line of fat German women. Um, but yet they still like the greatest sin in my family would ever to be fat. Um, so nobody wanted you to be fat. And uh, I was just super hyper conscious of it all the time from the time I was very, very young. Um, as I got older, I tried to exercise the crap out of my fat. Um, I just made a decision in my early 20s that I was going to get fit. And I went on a super great diet and I started going to the gym and the very first day that I show up and I go to the aerobics class, you know, it's, it's hard, it's a new class, it's crowded, I've never seen the choreography. I went left when the class went right and this thin girl shoved me out of her way and told me to get my fat ass out of there. And I was like, wow, that's pretty demeaning. But I persevered, um, I did get really, really fit I used to take the stairs two at a time, and none of this is used to justify my fatness. I'm just, it's just trying to tell you the story of who I am and how I came to be where I am now. Um, I took stairs two at a time everywhere I went. I had what I would refer to as the gigantic buns of steel. I took step class with all the skinny girls. 
I then went and did like half hour of weights. Then I did another half hour walking on the treadmill. And then all I ate was like a turkey sandwich. I really, really tried, but the weight would not come off. It just would not come off. And uh, that's where I started to get this idea of, well, I can be fit and fat. And that, and that, that's, that's good enough. That'll work. But it really doesn't work because you're still struck by all the stigma and all the other issues that come with being seen as a fat person or an obese person. And uh, it, it didn't it didn't last in that way that I felt like this is OK for me. I felt like I still had to be thin. I had to figure out some way to be thin whatever. So I tried everything. I tried every diet, Optifast, Medifast. Sometimes you lose some weight, but then we'll come right back. Um, I even tried gastric bypass surgery. Not the, not the one they do today where the thing is removable, but like the hardcore, totally take a perfectly functioning gastrointestinal system and mess it up so that you temporarily starve and lose weight. Um, I had very serious complications from that surgery and nearly died. Um, and I have lifelong issues from that surgery that I continue to have to deal with health wise. Um, so after I put back on, I did never lost all of the weight that I wanted to lose even close to it from the surgery. I was just sick all the time. After that, I decided enough. That was my place. <laughs> And that enough was simply, I'm done trying to be something that I clearly can't figure out how to be. So I need to just start being out, being who I know that I am and what I am and who I am in this, because this is the body that I have. And this is, this is, this is what I need to do to uh, live in this world. And this is how I experience the world through this body. So. I was incredibly um, inspired by Roxanne Gay, uh, who is an author and a fat activist, and also by Whitney Waythor, who is a reality TV show star. But her reality TV show is called My Big Fat Fabulous Life, whether you've seen it or not. Um, it is a reality TV show, but she also talks about the struggles um, with being the size that she is in, in an unapologetic way. And I was really uh, inspired by them. And I felt like I wanted to do something so that people could understand what it was like to experience life in this body. So I started out by doing a quick talk at work um, for, for our diversity group at work where it was very well attended and shockingly when I asked for questions hands shot up all over the room uh, because people really did have questions they really didn't know what my experience was like living in this body and I was incredibly open and candid with them they were also incredibly respectful and kind to me which definitely helps <laughs> um, and uh, I felt like after sharing what it's like to live in this body with my coworkers, I sort of came out. Um, I stopped trying to pretend that I wasn't fat. I stopped trying to hide in the shadows in the corners. I sort of just came out loud as fat. And so when there wasn't a chair in a room that would be comfortable for me, I would say, hey, there's no good chair in this conference room. I'm going to go to the next conference room and get one that's comfortable for me. And being comfortable in saying that around my coworkers was revelatory. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally changed the way that I um, do everything here at work. I, I feel no longer like I have to apologize for taking up space. I don't feel like I need to um, try and make myself smaller, uh, you know, emotionally or with my ideas or with my voice. And it's been just uh, a wonderful thing. Um, so I live now in, in what I term unapologetically fat. I'm fat. 
my butt needs a bigger chair. Let's all just be fine with that <laughs> because I'm still a human being who has great ideas. I'm incredibly smart and uh, I love being part of a team and, and I love making the television show that we make. And so um, that is how I try and live my life now. But I'm not going to, to sugarcoat it and say, you know, with all this body positivity thing and say that it's wonderful. It is still a struggle because there are constant microaggressions and there are a significant barrage of macroaggressions, such as people driving by in the street, street and screaming fat pig at you. I mean, those are the kinds of things that fat people deal with all the time. And it's, it's still a struggle not to be able to be accepted by everyone um, for who you are, which is frustrating. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, let's continue on. So this next part is about blame. So not this past forum. I, I did a, a thing about blame at the, this past forum, and a few of the slides are in here. But the, the forum the year before, um, which I really want to thank the forum for giving me an opportunity to speak at all, because um, obesity generally isn't recognized as a as a protected class, and uh, it's usually excluded from the inclusion of diversity. So I really appreciate the forum allowing me uh, to be included so that we could I could bring some of these topics to light in the DEI um, community. So I did this little 20-minute uh, spotlight called What's the Big Fat Deal? and sort of talked about uh, the um, workplace issues with being fat and it went online as things do uh, go on the internet and as things on the internet live uh, so do comments which are toxic wretched things that i try to avoid but uh, i had to look <laughs> um, and see these are some of the of things that they said and it's i also got some positive comments so it's not just that but I felt like I had done this incredibly well-researched, um, personal, uh, heartfelt um, message, and it was just completely lost in this blame culture of fat equals lazy equals unhealthy equals it's your fault. And I thought, well, that kind of sucks, so how can I approach this? Um, so I started to, to look, you know, do some research about blame, what I call the blame dynamic and why, why even, why do we blame? I mean, why, why do we blame at all? Anybody for anything? Why do we blame? And there are three, well, there are a lot of reasons, but these are, these are three, um, well-known, um, things that, uh, or, or, theories of blame that I looked up. And one is a uh, fundamental attribution error, the hindsight bias, and the just world phenomenon. And we're going to just go quickly through those so that we can get an idea of why do we blame? Because fat people do get the brunt of blame for anything that uh, anyone wants to put the blame on for us. We're lazy, we smell, we're stupid, we're um, unhealthy, we drive up healthcare costs, we, um, we aren't as good of workers. You, anything anybody wants to do, well, it's your fault because you're fat, that's your fault. So why do we blame people? Well, the fundamental attribution error is really, really interesting to me. Um, it's how we frame ourselves in the world. Generally speaking, when something happens, like say we fail a test, right? We're going to say, darn it, that teacher didn't cover that stuff well enough, or it was really hot in the room and I was really tired, so I just couldn't concentrate. We're not likely to say, well, I did not study hard enough for this test, right? We're gonna look at other reasons why we didn't have anything to do with it. We're gonna look for external reasons. When something happens with other people, say your friend nailed the test, you're gonna do the opposite. You're gonna say, well, pfft, well, she must have got a copy of that in advance, or how could she study that harder? How did, I'm smarter than her. You know, you're, you're gonna figure out 
you're going to blame her for succeeding and, and, and let yourself off the hook. And that's sort of what we do when we um, use a fundamental attribution error. So an example would be, hey, I got a promotion at work. Woo! -hoo! I'm super smart. I'm smarter than everybody else. And I'm the best employee. But if your friend gets that promotion, well, they're the brown noser of the year. And didn't they get lucky? Right? So that's what the fundamental attribution error is in a nutshell. Um, the th interesting thing about fundamental attribution error in culture is that it tends to really rear its head in indiv individualistic, wow, that's a mouthful, cultures such as the United States, you know, American dream, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and some of these other countries listed here, which I think is really interesting because in cultures that have that aren't individualistic that are more community based this uh, attribution error does not happen as much the hindsight bias well i mean everyone's heard that hindsight's um 2020 right so i like to look at the titanic movie not the titanic well they probably had hindsight about the titanic too but the movie specifically this scene where uh, Jack does not get on the headboard or whatever it is that Rose is floating on, and he tries to get on it. And I mean, I've heard so many people say, I would have shoved her butt over and gotten on there. So there's no way I would have stayed in that water and frozen. Lots of people say that. I don't think he thought he was going to freeze to death because he thought the boats were going to come back. Was, which was typical of the time. Um, other people say, well, she was on a lifeboat already and she jumped back on. It's her fault. He could have found that. Well, she didn't know this was going to happen either. Um, interesting thing, there have been people who have done like scientific um, analysis of what this door was made of and would it have the ability to float if both their weights were on it. And any long story short, it's an oak according to uh, James Cameron, it's an oak piece. If they'd both been on it, it would have sunk too low into the water and they both would have frozen to death. So there you go. Uh, the just world phenomenon. This one's really interesting too. This is how we continue to function in society, um, even though we know that bad things happen to good people, right? Bad things, happen to good people, um, but we don't want to think that because that means bad things could happen to us. And we like to think that if we are good people and we go to work and we work hard, then we're going to get promoted and we're going to earn more money or we're going to go to school and we're going to do a good job and we're going to get a degree and we're going to, you know, we have to feel like that if we follow these rules that things will turn out for us, even though we all know that's not really the case, right? Um, bad things can and do happen to everyone, but it's a lot easier for us to keep our place in this society by assuming when something bad happens to someone that it has to be something that they did because then we can absolve ourselves of that. So if she's really, really fat, it has to be her fault. She did something like eat 15 pizzas a week and I would never do that. So it's her fault she's fat, and that could never happen to me. And the interesting thing about that to me is that I found that people who are um, already sort of on the spectrum of being of size really buy into this. Uh, if, if, if I stay on the right diet, I won't get that fat. And there's an acceptable level of fat. That, I've heard that talked about many times. Well, you're fat, but you're not that fat. Like there's, there's like some sort of fat degrees that I'm actually, even though I'm in the fat world, I'm not privy to what the actual fat degrees are because they're, they're based in people's minds. And it makes it easier for them to blame other people. It's a protection for yourself. It's not because uh, people are uh, evil or vicious and want to hurt people. It's just a way that we can protect ourselves in the current society in which we live. And so some examples um, of that and I'm sorry, I'm behind on my notes. 
would be, uh, you know, here as a homeless person, uh, you know, they should just get a job, right? Get a, go to work. I work. They should work too. Who cares if they're homeless, right? Oh, poor neighborhoods. See, if these people just kept their um, buildings in good repair, their property values would go up and then they'd have more wealth. Mm. Why should I care about low wage workers? I mean, they should go out and get an education if they want to make more money, right? Um, if black men want to get a job, they need to pull their pants up. I'm sure you've heard people say that. Hey, if you come to this country illegally, I don't care if we put your children in cages. I mean, that I've heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And, you know, what were, what were you wearing? You know, men, men can't, you know, they can't control themselves if you put it on a silver platter. These are all um, examples of how we blame people so that we can feel like these things won't happen to us. You know, no one's ever going to put our children in cages because we didn't come to this country illegally. No one's ever going to rape us because we don't dress slutty. You know, those kinds of things are, are what this is in relation to. Um, actually, I would be okay if, and maybe because I don't want to, like, mess up Ben and everybody, if, if there were any burning questions right now before we start the video series part, I would be willing to take them, but maybe we told everyone to hold them and there aren't any, and that could also possibly be it. Uh, it doesn't look like there are any. Okay. In a minute. Oh, actually, um, someone just, um, Karen just said, I'd like to say that I admire your bravery in sharing your story. Oh, well, that's, thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. I don't feel brave, though, so I just feel. Uh, free, actually. Um, someone else said, I don't know what's coming, so it's hard to know what to ask. So maybe we should just hold off for questions. Today. All right, then let's jump right into this video series. I want to give a shout out to my uh, PBS brethren at Nova. Uh, they do a great science show. I'm sure most of you have probably heard of Nova. Um, they have a, this segment on obesity. Uh, I find it really fascinating. I've broken it up into a few uh, short clips um, so that we can have some poll questions in between and a little discussion. Um, it's, it's an amazing um, uh, a bit of science and I am, I'm really curious to see the answers to your poll questions and so let's get started because this one starts out with Neil deGrasse Tyson and you know, woohoo! Okay, we talked about bungee cords, that stretchy force that binds protons and neutrons. They're kind of like springs. Of course, what's great about springs is their flexibility. With some effort, I can stretch it or I can make it smaller, <laughs> at least for a little while. But it always bounces back to a certain predetermined size. Well, according to some researchers, people might be like this too. No matter how hard we struggle to lose weight, our bodies will keep bouncing back to about the same size. And as David Duncan reports, that size might be predetermined by our genes. We are what we eat. And as we eat more and more, many of us gain weight we'd rather not have. But for some people, like Teresa Godfrey, the compulsion to eat is a lifelong struggle. I try and control it as much as I can, but there are days that I cannot control it and I just eat and eat and eat and eat and I don't know when I'm full really. And I'm aware that I'm doing it, but I can't stop it. Since childhood, Teresa has faced ridicule, embarrassment and blame for being overweight. So is her only son, Jake. Parents in the playground used to look over and look at me because I'm big, Jake's big, and just thought that we sat there all day and ate food, basically. I was just going to ask you a few questions. Patients like Teresa and Jake have had really a very tough time from a very young age. They've often been blamed for being overweight and obese, and it's amazing how we fail to see that actually being overweight and being obese can be due to a biological reason, can be due to your genes. Suppose you could prove that for certain patients, it's not lack of willpower that causes obesity, but the lack of a chemical inside the brain which tells us to stop eating. 
That would be no surprise to Jeffrey Friedman, an obesity researcher at Rockefeller University in New York City. Friedman believes that for each of us, eating behavior is, to a large extent, hardwired by our genes. What makes some people weigh 350 pounds and other people 150 pounds, to a very large extent, those are genes. And each of us are predetermined to be at a particular weight. Some people heavy, some people thin, most people in between. So we have very little control over our weight, that there's a set point. The set point defines a range for each person, and people can operate comfortably within that range. But the further one wants to deviate away from the set point in either direction, the more difficult it becomes. So that if you're at your stable weight and you want to lose 50 or 100 pounds, it is very, very difficult over the long term. I lost 35 pounds in between eight and nine months. Um, I find it very difficult, um, but did lose it. Um, but it, it went back on. As soon as you stop dieting, it just goes straight back on. For obesity, the evidence from a number of sources would suggest that it's 70 to 80 percent genetic, which is the highest hereditability that's been recorded with the possible exception of height. 20 years ago, Friedman began experiments to uncover the genetics behind the hunger drive, trying to discover why certain lab mice are born with such a compulsion to eat that they become almost too fat to walk. Then, in 1994, Friedman and his collaborators made a groundbreaking discovery. These obese mice lacked a previously unknown hormone, which signaled the brain to stop eating. Friedman named it leptin, after the Greek word for thin. So it's a poll time. Can everyone hear me still? Okay. Um, do you agree with that spring theory of weight that's mentioned in the video? So just curious. Interesting. Well, that's pretty amazing. I, I would have thought it would be a little more even, but I'm glad that you guys see that that's possible or perhaps you've seen it in your own life. I think it's really interesting when he says that uh, the only thing that's possibly more genetically determined is height. Um, because you would never go up to someone and say, you know, why don't you just grow six inches? Or could you just be less tall? I mean, you would never, you would never do that to anyone. So it is entirely possible that weight, given this very fledgling beginning of this type of research, because as we go through this, you'll see that there's, this is just one tiny piece of the whole uh, weight regulation system of the body. This is just one part um, that this is. Um, not necessarily uh, trying to think how to say this. Um, it's not necessarily uh, our fault, but at the same time, it's not understood. So no one can say for sure that it's not our fault. So then we continue to have that sort of um, stigma anyway, even with some research. It's interesting the the video comments again comments, video comments, the wasteland of the universe, on this uh, particular Nova segment on YouTube are almost 90% negative. Um, basically saying things like, Teresa, I hate Teresa, I, I feel bad for her kid, this is crap, these aren't experts, you know, these are all people with PhDs featured on Nova, but whatever, you know, the, I'm sure the commenters in YouTube know better. Um, so let's go to the next one, and um, these will get shorter as we go through, too. Leptin is a hormone made by your fat that circulates in the blood that then sends a message to your brain reporting how much fat you carry at a given point. The five milligrams of leptin in this bottle are ten times the amount that can circulate in our bloodstream, where it acts like a thermostat to tell the body if it's starving or if it has enough fat to survive. How it works becomes clear when you see an animal genetically altered to produce no leptin at all. You'll notice a few things about these animals. One, obviously, this animal is a lot larger or heavier. That animal is moving around everywhere, and this animal hardly moves at all. The only difference between these animals is a defect in a single gene, the gene that encodes for this hormone leptin. 
and how does this relate to humans? Humans have the same hormone and when humans are lacking this hormone leptin, as is this animal, they too become massively obese and eat more. It turns out that this animal, because it lacks leptin, never gets the signal that it has sufficient fat and thinks it's starving. Now, if you were to give this animal leptin injections, replace the leptin it can't make on its own, they eat less, they lose weight, their fat content goes down. Friedman's discovery created a sensation. Was this the holy grail for the overweight? A possible cure for obesity? I remember precisely the day I read the Friedman paper and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up because I thought, oh, my word, this is a real insight into how body weight is, is, is controlled. Unfortunately, when leptin injections were given to obese human patients, most of them did not lose significant amounts of weight. Still, Stephen O'Reilly, director of the obesity clinic in Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, England, believed that Friedman's discovery held an important key to human appetite, if he could understand how leptin worked. Leptin does something to the brain, it suppresses appetite, it does it through a series of steps. Once leptin reaches the brain, it turns off cells that increase appetite and turns on cells that decrease appetite in a dual action that suppresses hunger. A central switching component in the leptin process is the melanocortin-4 receptor, or MC4R, which receives and passes on the message to damp down hunger. If these receptors are altered by genetic mutation, their surface becomes malformed, unable to process the message to switch off appetite. It will be very difficult to be a patient with one of these mutations. Try to get slim. And when your brain is screaming, you are hungry, you must eat. You're just ravenous and you just have to eat it. And you can't stop. Some days you can't stop eating and you're on and on and on and on and on. So you just eat anything until you're just full up and then you just, you regret it. It's like, it just takes over you. Until you actually physically begin to feel sick. And then you think, well, why did I eat all of that food? Why did, I didn't really want that. Why did I eat it? Just head at this end. Eight years ago, Teresa Godfrey came That's to it. the obesity clinic in Cambridge searching for answers. They have always known that there was some reason why they were always hungry. They've always thought there was some reason why they gain weight more easily than others. And effectively, what we're able to do is to provide them an, for an explanation for that. The new scientific breakthrough is understanding the gene that codes for the MC4 receptor. Teresa's gene has a mistake that causes her receptor to grow incorrectly. When we actually look at the gene in the lab, what we find is that one particular one of those building blocks is actually different. And that's enough to stop this gene making a receptor that works. Sadaf Faruqi extracted Teresa's DNA from a blood sample, then put it through a process to isolate the gene that encodes for her MC4 receptor. And I think when MC4 is done, we need to think about which other genes might be relevant to these patients. This gene was then amplified and inserted into a living cell in Faruqi's lab, which then grows Teresa's receptor in a flask. And when it's in those cells, those cells can then be grown up and can actually behave in the test tube as if they were in Teresa's body. So essentially in this flask are some cells which grow up and express Teresa's MC4 receptor on their surface. We add the hormone that normally activates the receptor. So basically the hormone should dock on the receptor and give us a readout. A normal MC4 receptor reads out 100% but Teresa's malformed receptor reads out zero. So Teresa's receptor is really non-functioning. Poll time. So how much do you think Teresa's faulty receptor impacts her ability to lose weight? I'm really um, curious about what you guys think. I mean, I think it's really interesting that even though this is a PBS piece, they still do the headless fat people b-roll um, that's something that samantha b recently addressed um, in a segment that she called uh, fat people have heads and they've created a bunch of great b-roll of fat people just living their lives not shoving their faces full of food um, and uh, it's really nice to see that it's really funny because um, in the chat looking at the chat someone i don't know if you saw that someone said no. oh my god headless bodies they need to not do those stock video clips. 
Yes. Uh, no, so, I didn't see that, but I, I love Samantha B and I love that she put that out there. So they, it, they actually have it out there for people to license to use their B roll with fat people with heads. So we do well, all have them. <laughs> Well, and uh, yes, and our, our, the people, our attendees noticed that as well. So hi, Tom. <laughs> That's nice. great. Thank you. you in the chat. And I'm, I got to try, I can see that time is burning. So I'm going to burn through the rest of these slides as quickly as I can. I see that you guys see that it, it affects her a lot and or somewhat. And I, I would imagine, personally, I don't think this is my issue, but I would imagine because I, I do get full and I do stop eating but I do imagine that if I never got a signal from my body that I was full that it would be brutally hard to stop eating um, so that's just my piece on that these next two um, video clips are definitely shorter than the first two and then we'll have some slides about how this affects employment and then I will I promise I'll make time for questions and I can stay later if, if you need to or you can send me questions later but I want to get through the rest of this because I think it's important if you're still here and you're interested oh no I'm like the wrong way. Okay, here we go. Measuring Teresa's mutation has allowed the doctors at Addenbrooke's for the first time ever to use genetics to accurately predict how much a patient will eat. Basically what we can show is that the defect in a single gene and a single molecule and how it behaves in the lab determines the amount of food people will eat at a single meal. Hi, I've got your lunch here. Thank you. So you can have whatever you like. We might find that a person who is of normal weight and whose MC4 gene is working normally might eat somewhere in the round of about four to 500 calories when allowed to eat freely. Teresa and with Jake, in fact, they would eat probably two and a half or three times as much. Dr. Fruki phoned me and told me the results and I cried on the phone because I was just so relieved. I cried for Jake, not for me, more so than anything else. Jeff Friedman's discovery of leptin in 1994 was a phenomenal catalyst to not only my work, but the whole of the field. Okay. This was yeah, the regular. first time that a real molecule truly was regulating body weight in mammals. And we went on then to show that obviously it was relevant for humans too. How many people have this MC4 receptor problem and how does it compare to other genetic disorders? Our best estimate so far is that around one in a thousand people carry a mutation in MC4 and are obese. That means that worldwide there'll be tens if not hundreds of thousands of people with this disorder. So it's not by any means rare. and It's certainly commoner than some well-known genetic disorders such as muscular dystrophy or cystic fibrosis. Do you worry that people will look at this and say, aha, it's not the you know, the Big Macs, it's, it's uh, genetic. Clearly, if you eat fast food all the time and are very sedentary, whatever your genetic makeup, you're going to gain weight. Clearly, if you have genes that predispose you to gaining weight, you'll gain even more. So it's always a balance of the two. I think even people who are overweight or obese and don't have an MC4 gene problem, they will have other genes that are contributing to them gaining weight very readily. That's something that I absolutely believe because this is just a single gene that they've found. So another quick poll, it's a yes, no. If science found out unequivocally that severe obesity, I mean like unequivocally, like stories all over the news, it's not our fault that we're fat, it's a medical reason, would you feel more empathy to very large people? And I don't see the poll. Yeah, one second. Or we could just assume yes, because we're all uh, awesome people. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I'm sorry, I must have missed that one. But That's just, okay. Let's, just, no, let's just assume, let's just assume yes. I was going to say, or okay we could answer that. it in the chat. Eh, I'd like to assume everyone here is lovely. And let's just... Uh, <laughs> Yes is across the board so far. That's right. That's right. Um, and, you know, I, I do think uh, we got more of the, the headless fat people in that clip. And, um, you know, obviously nobody thinks who's a, a very fat person that diet and exercise don't have something to do with our health. It's not that. It's just that um, we know that we have tried everything and we know that, you know, environmentally this planet has changed a lot. We know that our food supply has changed a lot, say in the last 50 years or like in my lifetime, and that something is causing this. And we've made this war on obesity. Um, 
which has ultimately just turned into a war on obese people. It just like the war on drugs didn't solve the war on drugs. It just made being a drug user more stigmatizing. So I think, um, you know, I just wanted to say that because it, it's it's something that really bothers me. It's It's not that I want to feel faultless. It's just that I know that it's not all my fault. And it's it's really hard to claim that in a society that has a war on obesity and assumes that, um, you know, if we just made better choices, we'd be skinny. Not, not, it's not always true. This is the last little piece, and I think it's really poignant. Scientists are already identifying other genes that contribute to obesity. The hope is to create medications that can help people who have inherited these genes maintain a healthier weight. But until then, overweight people should try to maintain the lowest weight their biology will allow. People should do what they can to improve their health, and that would include being at the lower end of their range, exercising, eating a heart-healthy diet. So I think we need to focus on what we can do and improve health to the extent of our ability, but not criticize people because they can't lose hundreds of pounds. It's their biology that makes it difficult to lose those hundreds of pounds, not some personal failing. When I found out about the MC4R, it was a relief, a relief and a release to know that actually, yes, it's not all my fault and there's a reason for this happening to me. I just like to be as I am now. I've accepted the way I am. If you would say to me, would you rather win the lottery or would you rather find out about MC4R, I would say MC4R any day. You can keep your money. I love, uh, I love how, she, how it ends there um, because it, it was just that freedom that she finally felt to just be who she was is amazing. Um, how freeing something like that is to know that something is not all your fault. You're not a total failure when you're constantly told that you are a failure in every way, shape, or form. It's very frustrating. So, and I see the poll is mostly uh, people believing that. I, I thought what he said, this actual quote, it's their biology that makes it difficult for them to lose those pounds, not some personal failing. Uh, I think when people think it is a personal failing, they're a person who does not have a hard time losing weight, or they're a person who was very big and managed to lose the weight and struggles to keep it off and feels like everyone can do that. Um, I don't know that that's true, but that's just, um, you know, my thoughts. But I'm glad that you all, um, I hope you guys got something out of that. Now, quickly, I just want to go through these next slides that are about um, size discrimination in employment, which is probably why you're really here. But I feel like you can't just say, okay, here's these fat people, and this is what you should do with them. I think you really need to understand, understand them. Um, and I keep trying to get that off. Okay, so basically, like I said before, we're not a protected class. There's no federal law that protects workers based on size discrimination. People think that we're covered under the ADA. However, we are not. Um, Michigan is the only state that has laws prohibiting that um, discrimination. It wasn't an intentional thing that they did. It was sort of a legislat legislative mistake, um, which I, I find very hilarious. However, the cities listed below have enacted anti-fat discrimination laws, and I'm really proud of them because they did do it intentionally. And so, unless you live in one of these cities or in the state of Michigan, at any time, my employer could walk in here right now and say, Lisa, you're too fat, you're fired. And so that's something that we ha have to live with, even, even though it's a, I have a desk job. Um, so the size discrimination is real, and it is really, really damaging. Okay, so I have some stats here. I think the, the most profound one there is that white females, and this is simply, I'm not, you know, holding up white females, it's just the research that was done, are 9% less than salary for every 65 pounds they are over the average. And that equals one and a half years of education or three years of work experience. So that is strictly because of the size of your body. And that has nothing to do with your skill or, or any, just, it's only just prejudice that people have against people of size that makes them think that we are going to be 
poorer workers, that we are going to, that we should earn less if, if they're willing to hire us at all. Um, as you can see, the Michigan State University, they found that we are actually just as good as smaller people at working. I mean, there are some physical jobs that obviously wouldn't be appropriate, but a great deal, a great many jobs, we're just as good as, as everybody else. And that hiring professionals are really not into hiring us. I mean, just based solely on appearance. So we know that when we go out looking for a job, we are gonna be struck down constantly, strictly because of our appearance. I can't tell you how many times when I've looked for work that I had killer phone interviews only to go to an in-person interview, have the interviewer sigh, look me up and down, and dismiss me after five minutes. Um, this is after talking for two hours on the phone and seeming like it would be a great fit. I mean, it, you know that, it's, we know, okay? But there's nothing I can do about it because there's, there's, there's no protections for us. Um, you know, and why does this matter? Well, I think it matters because I think, um, since this affects women more than men, men become affected by it when they become very morbidly obese or significantly large. If they're, you know, anywhere from, you know, a few dad bod <laughs> to, uh, you know, pretty, pretty chunky, they're fine. They're a big guy. Nobody cares. When they get very, very big, then it becomes an issue. So women tend to be affected by it more than men. People of color, um, African-American and Hispanic melee tend to have higher BMIs than white people. Um, and so allowing um, this to continue to be sort of a loophole, well, we don't need to hire this person because they're fat and a female, you know, even though it might all be subconscious, it's allowing us to continue to have a loophole. And I think until we include this size or looks into the diversity spectrum, we are going to never close the gender pay gap, period. There's always going to be this continued uh, loophole for discrimination. So that's, I think, a really good reason to add it. Um, and why does it even matter? Well, there's a really good business case for it. More than 60% of the population is considered overweight or obese. So if you don't hire people who are overweight or obese, you are gonna really be limiting the number of employees in your candidate pool. And you're probably gonna be missing some really amazing, smart, funny people. Um, it, it's always better to have you know, another person at the table who has a different perspective. I know that at, at my um, job, I can give a quick, you know, we're creating a, a, a game to go with our show, a, a digital game, and the game company um, was pitching an idea to us, and of course it was, it was an ocean setting, and the evil, the evil person in it was going to be this big fat manatee, big fat, like ant manatees are so evil. But it had to be, it was like always a fat character. And I just kept saying, you know, we don't need to perpetuate this thing that the fat people are always the mean people and the angry people and the hostile people. Can we not have the villain be a fat sea creature? And we don't. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I mean, at least I hope, I hope it is. Um, I think uh, that the other thing is, is that when we have prejudice in a hiring practice based on looks or size, um, you're gonna have low morale and more turnover because people are gonna see that it's not a fair playing field and um, they're gonna move on. And one of, I think, the best things to note um, <clears throat> about having a really inclusive uh, environment that's comfortable for people of size is that when people of size no longer are spending all their time obsessing about how not to appear to be a person of size or how to stop being a person of size, they can just start being themselves and they can actually contribute more if they're not preoccupied by all that buzz in the background. And that's my opinion. Uh, there are three simple things that you can do to make your organization more size friendly. Literally, three simple things. We do not require a lot of extra care. 
<laughs> believe it or not. The three things you can do, you can add size and shape or weight and height or looks to your diversity policy. That is going to let an applicant know and let your staff know that we're not going to tolerate any lookism here. Um, chairs. Chairs are probably the biggest bane of the existence of a fat person. <laughs> we just need sturdy, armless chairs. Sturdy, armless chairs. So if you care about fat candidates, please have sturdy, armless chairs available for them in the interview rooms and in the waiting areas. And for your employees, just, just let them have chairs. Otherwise, the normal ADA accommodations that you have to have for everyone are more than adequate for us. We just need some sturdy chairs, really. My, my kingdom for a sturdy chair. And there are some really great uh, training toolkits at nafa.org, which is a national association to advance fat acceptance. They have some great toolkits for training, and they're free, they're online, they're available for training hiring managers, for training executives, for making the business case. Um, they, they've done all the hard work of that, and it's just out there and available, and they've been around for 50 years. I think they've been having a really hard time advancing um, this message, and I understand why, because it's, it's a hard message to get across to people. Um, but, you know, we, we try, <laughs> and so that's what we're doing. And now I'm ready for questions, and I will literally answer, and I'm sorry, it's gone a little long. I will literally, literally answer all your questions. Great. Um, thank, um, first of all, thank you so much, Lisa, for that wonderful webinar. Um, the, we do have a couple questions that popped up from before. Okay. Um, let's see. Is this a question? Still trying to process the comparison of people of size to race, rape, and other circumstances. Don't know. Was the question exactly? Um, I'm not sure what the question is there. Um, it's from Kristen Williams. Um, well, she's still on and she wants to elaborate a little bit. I will be happy to try and answer that. I'm not sure I understand. Are you, uh, yeah, I can't guess to as her intention. Yeah, <laughs> um, we'll go give a second to see if Kristen wants to elaborate. But let's, um, the next question is, what is the difference between overweight and obese? Um, that's a medical terminology. I, I really hate the medical terminology, but it's based, currently they're using BMI. Um, I don't know the exact BMI where it changes over because I really don't care about those things. And also because they've termed me super morbidly obese, which is such a wonderful medical term. I really love it. Um, it's so inviting. Um, and you no, know, whenever someone uses that term with me, I always tell them it needs to come with a cape and a superpower <laughs> because that's just wretched. So I don't know, but it's definitely based on BMI. And I'm sure you could Google it and find out in a hot second. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, how would you like to see yourself represented in fitness environments? Oh, in fitness, you know, just working out and not having people staring at us. I could tell you, oh, Lord, I could tell you. But behind, beyond the girl who pushed me, I could tell you so many stories um, about things that happened to me at the gym. But, I, you know, we're just human beings exercising, and we would just like to be represented as human beings exercising. Period. We're like everyone else. Which seems just obvious. <laughs> Should be so obvious. Um, That's how I feel about it. Let's see. We've got quite a few coming in. Let's ben, I'm tracking some questions from earlier in the webinar that, uh, that were missed inadvertently. Do you want me to read those? Can yes, please. And by the way, this is my colleague, Aaron Monson. He's our, Hello. our business Hi, manager. Aaron. Hi there. I just chime in randomly. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I have a question from da Jamie Tam all the way back at 11, 11 a.m. Uh, and that question is, is it appropriate for skinny people to use the term fat as a descriptor, even though the reclaiming of the term should come from actual fat people? Well, that is a, a really wonderful question. And, you know, the term has been used so long as a derogatory term. Um, this is, I, I'm going to tell a quick little story. I have, a, I have a colleague who works with children, and she was out uh, working, and she was with a first grade girl, and they were sitting waiting for the girl's mom to come, and the girl looked at my colleague's tummy and said, are you going to have a baby? Which, um, you know, never ask a woman if she's pregnant, but we, it's okay from children, but just as adults, just 
FYI, especially if the woman might just be fat. Anyway, um, so she said, no, I, I, I just have a fat tummy. And the little girl was just horrified. She said, but that's a bad word. And my colleague said, you know what? No, it's only a bad word when you're using it to hurt someone. It, it's it's a, just a descriptive word. Now, I would say it's just a descriptive word, and if you're not using it to hurt someone, I think it's fine. However, there still are a lot of people of size who are very traumatized and stigmatized by that word. And so I don't know that I could unequivocally say that we're at this point where it would be okay for a thin person to say it, unless you know your audience. Great, thank you. Uh, I have another question. Actually, there are two questions that are essentially the same thing. One from Amber uh, Markham at 1130 and one from Bria Turner more recently at 1201. Uh, they're phrased differently, but it looks like the question is ultimately the same. Someone had asked if a uh, person of size is the preferred term. You know, there, there is a very uh, big uh, body positivity movement right now, size acceptance movement. It, there, there's a lot of sort of infighting in it. I don't know that there is a um, preferred term that we've come to understand and accept is okay, like the gay community did. Um, I would say it's difficult to go wrong with person of size because it's pretty innocuous. Um, if you're wanting to reference the only reason why you would use that term is if it's in reference to, um, with, you don't really even need to use that term uh, unless you're using it is to draw up your, you know, some diversity documents or something. Because you could simply say, does this chair work for you? Instead of, would this chair work for a person of size? You know, I, I, think, um, I think that's the most innocuous one to use. Um, people don't like being called overweight. Uh, people don't like being called obese. They certainly don't like being called super morbidly obese, again, with the caveats that I said. Um, so it's really hard to say. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really representative of the entire size acceptance movement. I'm just who I am, and I think that that one is not um, a shameful or hurtful way to say it. Great, thanks. Um, one more question. Um, well, there are actually four more questions here, but one more from much earlier in the webinar uh, from Brent Holt at 1132. What would you say are the frontline issues to address in the workplace regarding people of size inclusion? And if you already addressed that, great. But if you'd like to address it again now, go for it. Um, yeah, it was that, the things that I put on those last three slides, I, I just popped it up again. You know, having that in your diversity policy lets people know that you're not going to discriminate on them based on that. That is incredibly important. Um, having the, you know, chairs, uh, literally it's just chairs, chairs available to work for people and, and to make sure that, that people understand that, um, how you should be addressing people of size using those toolkits. I mean, that's, that's really how you should be addressing it in your organization if, if it's an organization that wants to address it. And there are many that don't. I, um, yeah, there are many that don't. So I'm just trying, if yours does, then I'm super happy. <laughs> cool. Uh, this may be more of a comment than a question, although it does have a question mark, so I'm going to read it. Uh, from Victoria Ford at 1149. Isn't it interesting, though, that our empathy depends on being reassured that obesity isn't someone's fault? Fault is in quotation marks, and I believe that was a response to uh, the video about the genetics. Yeah, it uh, is interesting. It's, it's something that is it's probably the hardest part of being uh, someone who's fat, because there is this constant blame. Uh, imagine um, fighting against that blame right? You're, still, you're fighting against it and finding it in yourself, but yet you still run up against it all the time. And it's, it's, it's maddening. Um, you know, even if it were our fault, you know, I, are we still human beings who are capable of contributing to society and we're loving parents and children and and we're loving sisters and friends and you know there's no it's it's almost like it washes away your humanity in a way and it's it's yes 
<laughs> it is odd. Okay. Um, let's see. There are I, one, two, three, I have five more questions. Um, ultimately, I am willing to have you address as many of these as you have time for, and as, for as long I'm, as people are willing I'm to stay good. on. Yeah, I'm good until 1230 when okay. someone can knock at this room's door. Sure. Well, we've got 106 attendees still on, so people are clearly still interested. Uh, okay. from, from Sarah Zetterval at 1202, how do you address work health programs that include weight loss as a measure of success for financial discounts? Okay. I want to scream. Yes. No. They should never be tied to financial discounts. There is nothing more insulting than tying financial discounts to how much weight you're able to lose in this, you know, 12 week period program or whatever. I hate those. I do not participate in any, well, my, my workplace doesn't have any that are uh, tied to financial. Um, they did, you got a disc, they did before. If you took the, the health assessment, right, um, where they got to take all your your stats, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your BMI, blah, 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 the stuff that my doctor already does for you, then you got a discount on your health insurance. They stopped the discount part and I stopped going for it because I already know what all my numbers are because I see the doctor. Um, I think they're discriminatory and I think they should be abolished um, if, if there's a financial in component to it. I see no problem if an, an organization wants to offer that for their employees so that they don't have to go to the doctor, especially the kind of person that avoids the doctor at all costs and they can get it done at work. I have no problem with them doing it. I just don't think that it should be tied to a financial component because I think that's discriminatory. Great, thanks. Um, from Kristen Williams, since 60% of people are overweight or obese, should chairs available reflect that? What is a good rule of thumb in the workplace? Wow, what a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, yeah, that'd be great because, um, but you, you know, here's what's really funny. Our, our office remodeled a few years ago and they brought me with to the furniture place, which I thought was super nice. Um, but then they ordered a bunch of chairs that I told them were awful. <laughs> so that was really frustrating. So um, I actually brought my desk chair in here because I hate the chairs in this conference room so much. They hurt my, um, so I would say, you know, 60% should be just sturdy and armless. And, you know, if you have a conference room, oftentimes they make chairs that have both arms and don't have arms. And they did buy some without arms. And uh, so I always have to fight people for the armless chairs in the conference room. And I, I'm not everyone is as uh, open about saying, yo, move, I need that chair. <laughs> um, and they, they'll suffer in a, in a chair where they feel squished because they don't feel comfortable saying that. So I think it should be reflective of your workplace as, as to whether or not you should have armless chairs. And it's, it's literally just sturdy and armless. It, it's, it's not anything fancy. They can be of every, of whatever type of chairs you have there. We also have a lot of, for some reason, really low furniture that they bought that they thought was really cool that you're sitting like a foot off the floor and that's just not going to work for me. So I've never sat in those chairs. Thanks. Um, we have another question from earlier from two, uh, also from 1202 about um, hiring managers. Where was it? Oh. Do you think hiring managers think of rising health care slash insurance costs to their companies when looking at overweight candidates? Yes, I do. Um, I think, uh, and I think because there's not as much research, so, so the, the, the National Institute of Health, quickly I'm just going to try and pull this out of my head um, because it wasn't prepared to talk about the healthcare aspects, had something like it was between 35% and 100% more cost um, for obese people. Um, I have some theories about that. I think there needs to be a lot more research about that. And, you know, I know that in my own workplace, um, some of the people who run up the biggest bills are like the runners who have repeated surgeries on their feet. No one ever tells them to stop running and switch to swimming. <laughs> but, you know, uh, and no one ever says anything about someone who goes on a ski vacation and, and breaks their leg in six different places. And, oh, you know, those things cost a lot of money, too. 
um, and cost more than me. And uh, because I know what my healthcare costs are and I'm very conscious of that. Uh, but I, I do think they have that thought and they assume that we all have diabetes. They assume that we all have super high blood pressure. They assume that we have heart disease. They assume all of the things that are just perpetrated in the media. It's not at all the case. Everyone is different. Everyone is unique. And, um, and, and yes, that is something that we have to fight against. And that's part of the, I could talk for hours about how the media, you know, vilifies, um, fat people. But I think that's part of it. Yeah. I, I feel like I know how, how you're going to answer this one. But when a coworker expresses, I'm fat, um, I'm assuming in a negative tone, what can a person respond? Gut reaction is to reassure. Yeah, I don't reassure people who say things like that. I, I generally, if someone says, oh, I'm really fat, I'll say, mm. yeah, I usually just ignore that because that, that has to do with them. They're, they're not saying anything about me. You know, I've heard people say, well, if they think they're fat, then what do they think about me? They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. You know, and, and the one thing, though, I do like to do is when people talk about good and bad food, oh, I'm being so naughty. I had two of these cookies that someone brought in or whatever. I'm, I generally like to say, you know, it's just a cookie. It's, it's not bad or good. Food is simply, you know, uh, more um, caloric and devoid of nutrition or it's more densely nutritiously packed it's it's they're not good or bad they're just foods and so I generally just try and respond like that but I, you know realizing that it's really not about you I think is is the way that I deal with it um, I can't speak for everyone obviously because I'm just me thank you um, we are running a little bit, yeah, um, I know. quite, I, I mean, there are quite a few questions that I would love to be able to, um, um, have you answer, um, again, um, we will share Lisa's contact information if, if for to continue if you have any more questions. Um, actually there's one, do you have this, I'm going to ask this last question down here. Do you know of any national initiatives to make size and or appearance a protected class? when it comes to non-discriminatory HR policies? No, there's nothing. In fact, the last time Utah tried to pass um, a state anti-discrimination policy and there was laughter on the state floor. Um, so that didn't pass. Oh. Um, there's just, there's, there's, as I think it's a cultural thing. I think there will have to be a full cultural shift before there is a policy shift um, because people make policies and if people are still under the impression that you know where these um, you know, what the words they brought up unhealthy lazy stupid you know whatever people they're not going to um, advocate for us and and that's part of the reason why I do this because you know if I if I get one person to understand differently um, you know, that's how I'm trying to make an impact in the world. And I, I think there has to be a cultural shift. Either that or we could all just band together and eat the skinny people. I'm not sure what's the best choice. I'm going to go with the former, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm totally <laughs> but on that, on that note, on I that note. Thank, thank you, um, Lisa, and everyone who attended and, out, and everyone who stayed. I um, apologize. I know we went a little bit longer, but it was such a great webinar. And yeah, and we were, yeah, you could really tell by the enthusiasm and the conversation. And again, if we'd like to continue the conversation, we'd be sharing Lisa's information so that Feel you- Feel free. Feel free to send me. me. I have no problem answering questions from anyone, please. Wonderful, yes. So feel free to copy, um, um, send, uh, contact Lisa directly. And someone just asked, will there be a copy of the chat? Yes, the, the chats are saved. Um, we usually don't post them, but again, since this was such a riveting chat and a great conversation, we'll go ahead and post that along with this, uh, with the resources, uh, with the with the recording of the session. Um, as we mentioned, um, we want a special thank you to our sponsor, Aon. Uh, uh, thank you again for your continued support. As promised, the SHRM activity ID for the session is 19-2FFTK. And the HRC code is 390393. Both of those were posted in the chat earlier. Um, so again, I just want to thank you all for attending this webinar. Please join us 
um, for our next forum webinar next month. Uh, it is How Building an Inclusive Company Today Will Ensure Market Success Tomorrow with presenter Laura Went of AT Kearney on Thursday, June 20th at 11 o'clock a.m. Also, uh, we do have our, pod, our forum podcast series. A new episode of the forum podcast is now available. It's episode 12, Ready for Ramadan, Best Management Practices for Accommodating Your Muslim Employees. In, in this episode of the, of the forum podcast, Jelani Hussein, Executive Director of Karamen, shares the best management practices to support Muslim clients, employees, and colleagues. Visit the forum on workplaceinclusions.org slash podcast to listen. Um, the forum podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. For more information on upcoming webinars and podcasts and all upcoming um, events, including our call for presentations, which is opening next week, I'm sorry, call for proposals for podcasts, webinars, and of course, the conference, if you're interested in presenting in any of those, um, call for proposals for that will be opening next week. Um, so if you're looking for more information about that, DEI resources, um, and any, any of our other content, visit us at formworkplaceinclusion.org or uh, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and or Twitter. Um, for, uh, uh, just search for on Workplace Inclusion. And Lisa, if I were to go ahead and share your email in the chat, um, at, or I don't know if you have a slide that has it, but if you want to share it in the chat. I don't have a slide that has it. Let me see, where is my chat? Oh, I can, oh yeah, I forgot. I can put it on the chat. I'm putting it on the chat right now. Wonderful. And also I'll be, I'll be sending out, um, as I mentioned earlier, I will be sending out a um, survey, which will, uh, a survey which will also include Lisa's contact information for yes. anyone who wants to continue the conversation. Again, thank you so much, Lisa, for this wonderful webinar.